Well, very good morning to everyone. It's good to spend time together, and I appreciate another opportunity to share some of my studies of God's Word with you. And you may remember from times past President Reagan giving a speech, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And indeed, it did come down not long after that. It was something that was pivotal. It might be hard to relate to if you don't remember it, if you weren't uh, conscious of the things happening at the time. Uh, but this was a big deal. From the 1950s, people remember the duck and dive kind of uh, tests that were done in the schools. Uh, just in case there's an incoming missile from, from uh, Russia, you, you need to practice this. I always wondered, what's that supposed to do? If you get under your desk and we get hit with a nuclear bomb, do you really think that's going to help? It should be more like stand up and embrace it. Here it comes. I, I, I don't know. But this was the fall of a huge threat. And people remember this. The first time I saw a piece of that wall was in the George Bush, the George H.W. Bush Museum over in uh, Bryan College Station. I couldn't talk. I just soaked it up because of what it represented. But I'd like to tie that concept with Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8. There is a source of a lot of religious division, a lot of trouble, a lot of threat against souls that is linked with Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8 being misapplied, mishandled. Uh, you know, we're to handle accurately the word of truth, and it's not always done. So, going back, there's the day, uh, President Reagan, and there's uh, Mr. Gorbachev, Mikhail Gorbachev. At the fall of Germany, at the conclusion of World War II, part of the country fell to the Soviets, and part of the German country fell to the Americans, and so they divided. America stripped West Germany of its military capabilities, but upheld their freedom. Communism soon stripped East Germany of all of its freedoms. Not just its military, all of its freedoms. And as these Germans began migrating to West Berlin and West Germany to try to get away from the oppression, the Soviets decided, hey, we're losing our workforce, we've got to do something to stop this. So they said that the wall was to keep those wicked Americans out. But it, that, no, that's not what it is. Great Wall was erected and getting across it became exceedingly difficult. If you ever want to read some interesting stories, go read about the people who tried to get across that wall. It was a, an envelopment of the free part of Berlin, West Berlin, the Brandenburg Gate. You'll hear a lot of things about it. That's where the President, uh, President Reagan gave his speech. Checkpoint Charlie. There were a lot of th famous activities that happened at these places. And you remember the Berlin airlift? You've heard of that? That was back in the 50s, but, oh, we're not going to let anybody in. We'll starve them out. So they just started airlifting. And uh, lots of things that we could go back to and, and look at in history, but enough said on that. There was something big, and it needed to change. It was oppression. It was wrong. And it finally did change. I want to talk about Romans 14 now and matters of choice, uh, matters of con uh, conscience, I should say. Uh, they are matters of choice. They're not something that we have to do or something that we cannot do. They are matters of choice. They are thus left to our conscience. So Romans 14, we're going to read through this. Where he says in Romans 14, and the reason I have colors on here uh, as you're looking at this is just to emphasize one point and then a separate point. So it, it's just for the sake of that. Everything is black and white. But receive one who is weak in the faith. Now, what does that mean? We're going to talk about that a little bit more in just a second. But it does not mean anything goes. Some people say, see, it says you receive one who's weak in the faith. So if they believe that baptism is not necessary, you just have to live with it. <coughs> no, no, God's word is God's word. We don't negotiate on God's word. So that's not what it's about at all. But not to disputes over doubtful things. You receive people who are weak in the faith, but not over disputes, over doubtful things. Where did angels come from? I don't know. If someone wants to make a fuss about where they believe that angels came from, well, I believe they came from God. But exactly how did God create them when he was creating the earth? Were they already there? I don't know. I don't know. But some things that we don't know how they came about, 
We don't know what happened uh, on every point. And he says, leave those things alone. It doesn't matter. For one believes he may eat all things. Wait a minute. I thought we were talking about big philosophical points. Well, actually, yes, we are. You know, I always thought that it was certain Seventh-day Adventists that believe that they cannot eat meat. But I'm finding more and more that that's where Kellogg's cereal came from. That's where cereal, breakfast cereal, came from. Was people who said, well, you can't eat meat, so we need to make something different. And they started making cereal. And said, there's, there's got to be some way to get, get people not to eat ham and eggs and things for breakfast. But he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. If you don't ever eat meat, can you go to heaven? Yeah. If you only eat meat, can you go to heaven? might get there a little sooner if you only eat meat but you can go to heaven either way verse 4 who are you to judge another's servant to his own master he stands or falls some people want to take this as saying back off don't you tell me anything I'm going to choose to live however I want to live and the Lord said you can't say anything about it he did say to his own master he stands or falls What's right is right. What's wrong is wrong. And if the master says this is how it's going to be, they're going to stand or fall according to the master. Indeed, he will be made to stand or God is able to make him stand. Uh, for God is able to make him stand. So let's look at some of these points. To receive the weaker brother. There's one of our key words if you're on the interactive outline. The weaker brother in the faith. Is this saying that anything goes? Well, obviously not. It's not to disputes over doubtful things. Things that we can't be sure of. If God said, this is how it is, that's not a doubtful thing. So doctrinal issues are not what we're talking about. Doubtful things are what we're talking about. These are not doctrinal issues. Okay? Limits are immediately put into this, starting in verse 2, as we just read. He believes he may eat all things, but the other believes he can only eat vegetables. And, by the way, vegetables is really a word meaning non-meat, basically. Uh, let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. Let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. It's okay. And from what we see, God has received him. What are we talking about? Things that you can do or not do, and it's okay. If someone decides that they are never going to wear a certain color, is it okay? Yeah. So, I mean, there are all kinds of things that people decide, and for all kinds of reasons, if they're not binding it, now we're not talking about people binding things on us, and you know, binding where God is not bound, and things, we're not talking about that at all, but someone who says, I believe that I should not eat meat. Okay, fine. Someone says, I believe I should. Okay, fine. Not a problem. Those are the issues. These are doubtful things. These are things that are not doctrine. So, in Romans 14, 4, when he says, do not judge, what does this mean? Well, Matthew 7, verse 1. I've been whacked with this one pretty good. People tried to form it into a skillet and deliver it with force and said, how dare you? Do you not know the word of God? And oh, they, uh, they can let loose. Judge not that you be not judged. That's what it says. But I encouraged them to look at what follows. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you, you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, some people still don't get it. And they said, absolutely. So I'm not going to condemn anyone. And that way, I won't be condemned. The Lord has rules. We have to follow them. Is it not obvious from putting that thought with this thought that he's talking about non-doctrinal issues? Haven't you ever heard someone say, I just don't like the way they comb their hair? Haven't you ever heard someone say, I just don't like the colors that they choose to wear? Haven't you heard someone say all kinds of other things that make about as much sense? That's what he's talking about. Verse 3, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but don't consider the plank in your own? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Jesus was 
provided comic relief to a degree. That word plank is a word that's used, it, it, you know, we think about a plank as in a, a board. No, this is a beam like would be the major beam holding the roof up on a, on a structure. Something that we, a railroad tie size board. So you can imagine a railroad tie or a major structural component at the top of the house. This is probably bigger than your head. So how it sticks in your eye is kind of funny. He's making a joke. He's saying, you've got bigger problems than you know. Look at what he says in verse 5. Hypocrite. First remove the plank. We're talking about don't judge. And he says, you remove the plank from your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. He doesn't say, oh, now that's his speck, and you leave it alone because you're not to judge, and you leave his speck alone. He says, you need to see clearly, and you need to take the speck out of his eye. So we need to take the beam out of our own first. And look at what he follows up with right after this. Do not give what is holy to the dogs. Now, have you known anybody in history who liked to say, well, we're just the dogs, and, and, and you know, nobody likes having that as a reference to themselves. Don't give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine. Swine, that's always been an insult. Let's say trample them under your, their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. Judging. He says, you're going to try to help some people and they're not going to want your help. They're dogs. They're swine. Leave them alone. You try. They reject it. You try again. They reject it. Well, that's fine. Fine. And John 7, 24, remember this. When Jesus says, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Well, this is the same Jesus who said, judge not. How does he say, judge not, and then he says, judge with righteous judgment? Well, you see, one of them's about, thus saith the Lord. We've got a book, chapter, and verse, as we say. We can go to God's Word and show, this is where the Master says, you need to change. But this first one in Matthew 7, 1, is where we say, well, I don't like what you're doing. There's the difference. It's not about what we like or what we want. So we go back to Romans 14, 5, and we continue on. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. You know, there are some folks, and Jehovah's Witness, for instance, do not celebrate their birthday. They do not celebrate any day uh, because they say, nope, nope, that's esteeming one day above another. We're not to do that. Well, I don't think a birthday is at all what he's talking about. He's talking about a religious esteeming of a day. He says another esteems every day alike. Let each be, er, well, in this one, he's talking about birthdays and things. That's what I'm talking about. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. This is saying it's to the Lord. He observes the day to the Lord. So it can't be a, an observance. I want to make sure I said that right. I may have said it wrong. It's not about religious observance. It's about non-religious observance. And so to the Lord, he observes it. If we decide to remember the Lord on Thursday or every 17th of July, well, we don't have authority for that. We remember the Lord according to the pattern every first day of the week. We have authority for that. We can't do something to the Lord when we're not acting according to the pattern the Lord gave us to do he who eats, eats to the Lord. For the, He gives God things, and he who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat, and gives God things. Some people want to have a fast. Not a problem. You want to fast and pray? Not a problem. Somebody else says, well, I don't want to fast. I want to eat. Not a problem. Esteeming one day above another is not about religious observance. Colossians 3.17 says we have to have authority for what we do. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. In Romans 14.6, he who observes the day observes it to the Lord. He who eats, eats to the Lord. It has to be according to the pattern that God gives. There are limits to what this could include. Take a look. 
in Acts 15, verse 23, when there was this big fight about, uh, no, no, everyone who becomes a Christian has to keep the law of Moses. They have to be circumcised. They have to, and, you know, everybody's wanting to tack on different things. So they all got together in Jerusalem, and in Acts 15, they not only talked about, it talks about the meeting, but how they made the decision and sent this letter out. Uh, to inform everyone, here's clearing the air, here's how it's supposed to be. They wrote this letter, letter by them, uh, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment, it seems good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by the word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit. Now, there, there they're saying, this is from God. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. They're saying, we agree with whatever the Spirit says. The Spirit reveals this. This is what they didn't sit around and say, Well, I think it doesn't matter what you think. They're saying, We're going what the Spirit says, and to us, to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled. Now, there's three key words if you're, if you're on your uh, outline idols, blood, and strangled. Those are things that we're not to have, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. There's more going to heaven than just those four points. But those four points are part of going to heaven. So we cannot eat what was sacrificed to idols. One person eats, another does not. If you eat, you eat to the Lord. If you do not eat, you don't eat to the Lord. What's he saying? Oh, well, it means you can eat anything. I had a conversation with a guy in my office not too long ago about this very point. And he says, you can eat things sacrificed to idols. Um, um, no, I, actually, you, you can't. And I took him to this passage. He said, right, look right here. Oh, oh, I've never seen that. Okay. So things that are offered to idols, things with blood. The, the Germans have a blood pudding thing that they like, blood sausage. And, and he says, no, don't, don't do that. Things strangled in sexual immorality. Not to be a part of our, our life. Romans 14, starting at verse 7. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. He's not saying, well, when you die, you belong to the Lord, and everyone goes to heaven. He's talking about people who live not to himself, but to the Lord. If we live to the Lord, we die to the Lord. And he's taking our focus from... I think, I feel, and I want to say it's the Lord that's important. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord. Well, I think it doesn't matter. What does the Lord say? For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be the Lord of both the dead and of the living. So let's look at some of these points. Whether we live or die, we're the Lord's. Christ is Lord of both the dead and the living. It's not saying that we belong to God whether we obey Him or not. It's saying that we live in obedience to the Lord to be sure that when we die, we die in a faithful relationship to the Lord. Death is the next phase. It's not the end of the line. And he's saying everything continues on after death. He is the Lord of the dead as well as of the living. Romans 14, going down to verse 10 now. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? Now remember, there were people who would show contempt. Sometimes it was over things that were doctrinal. Okay? Sometimes it was over things that were not. Oh, those people are not Jews. Let's go eat over there. Well, that's not an issue. Those people are faithful brethren. There's not an issue here. They need to be accepted just like everyone else. No, no, they're not Jews, so we're not going to eat them. We will keep ourselves separate. That would be an issue. Why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? 
For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Not of ourselves to say, well, I felt, I thought. No, no, it's about what the Lord wants us to do. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. Every tongue shall confess to God. Was he just saying, we're going to die and we're going to be judged and we have to be faithful to what the Lord says. But as long as you do your checklist religion, everything will be okay. No, he's cracking this thing wide open. He says it's a lot bigger than that. Look, so that each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this. Look at the therefore. We're going to give an account. When we die, we're going to stand before the, the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to bow the knee and we're going to confess. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. He doesn't say, therefore, make sure you wash your hands in a certain way when you get back from the market. He doesn't say, therefore, make sure you cross all your, your T's and dot all your I's in your service to God. He says it's about what we do with other people. It's about our influence. It's about our effect. Oh, this was supposed to come up as bullets. I don't know how that happened. But Romans 14.10, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, as long as we're ready to answer for our own actions, it's okay, right? No. Every knee bows to Jesus. Every tongue confesses to God. Obedience is bigger than just answering for myself. It's about my influence. What is my influence doing? So then each of us gives an account of himself to God, and therefore, let us resolve not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. If I'm the reason that my brother or sister is having trouble in serving God, I don't want to answer to that because I can't answer to that. If they say, I don't believe that we should do this, and I just snub it and say, wow, well, whatever, we're going to do it anyway just to help you learn. I've heard of a gospel preacher who was up delivering a uh, meeting sermon. He was, he was a visitor preacher. And uh, he was talking about praying to Jesus, which, by the way, there's no example of praying to Jesus. Uh, we're told to pray to the Father through the Son. And he says, in fact, not only am I going to tell you that there's no problem with it, let us pray. And he went straight into praying to Jesus. Like, wait a minute. If there's somebody who says, hey, I've got a problem with this, and you're going to force the issue? No. That's not, that's not what the Lord says to do. Look with me at Matthew 18, 6, where Jesus says, whoever causes one of these little ones to believe, who believe in me to sin, it'd be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck. By the way, that word millstone, yeah, you've seen the dog, the the pony uh, walking in the circles and there's the big grinding stone that's not what this is talking about because as the pony walks in that circle or an ox or whatever it's turning this stone that's that's bigger than I'm going to want to ever pick up but that word is for the stone that this stone is riding on that gigantic stone so in other words he says You'll have many tongues hung around your neck. You're, you're not going to swim with that. He made sure, again, this is an extreme illustration. You're not going to swim with the small one. Nobody's going to swim with that. But he said, let's make sure we understand. We're talking about the big stone. Hung around his neck and drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, but offenses must come. Of that man by whom the offense is come, or the offense come. If your hand or foot causes you to sin. Now notice, you know, we read this and we talk about oh, if your hand causes you to, to sin, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. And obviously he's talking as an illustration. He's not saying that faithful Christians should walk around with no hands and no arms and no feet and because, you know, really you have to take your brain out because that's where it all starts. It's the desires that we have that leads us to sin. James tells us about that very clearly. He's talking 
as an illustration point. But look at what it comes back to. It's not about what causes me to sin as much as it's you better not cause somebody else to sin. And who's he talking about? One of these little ones who believes in me. He's not necessarily talking about the 95-year-old brethren who've been Christians for 92 years kind of thing. You yeah, have being sarcastic, but you get the point. People who've been a Christian longer than you've been alive, that's not necessarily who he's talking about. Babes in Christ are who he specifically mentions and says if we offend one of them, this is what we could also call the weaker brother. And someone says, well, wow, they're the weaker brother. They need to get a grip. That's not what Jesus said. He says, we need to get the grip. We better not cause the sin. And he says, it's so serious. Sin is so bad. If your hand or foot cause you to sin, cut it off. Cast it from you. It's not our hand or foot that he's talking about. But things that are very dear to us. Things... This is what my grandpa always did. I have such fond memories of whatever this is. And if it's causing an offense, get rid of it. If it causes an offense for me, or if it causes one of these little ones to sin. If someone says, I don't believe that we should have a water fountain. And if we had a water fountain, Someone says, I believe that that's wrong. Are we going to say, well, too bad. We like the water fountain. I wouldn't do that. In fact, I took out my little pocket knife and started unscrewing it from the wall for a guy one time. I didn't think he was really dedicated to what he was saying. But I thought it would make a good point to take it off the wall and take it out right now. So I turned off the water. And I started to remove the water fountain. What are you doing? What are you doing? If you say this causes you to be offended, we need to take it out right now. No, I was just making an illustration. Oh, well, then we need to talk about that. We can't cause offense. Romans 14, 14. I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. Now, that's a loaded line. This, this has some parameters that, that aren't all illustrated here, but they're by necessary inference. He's saying you can do anything you want to in life. No, obviously not. There's nothing unclean of itself in the realm of what he's talking about. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. I've had people, I've had brethren explain to me, well, it doesn't bother my conscience, but if it bothers yours, then you can't do it even on doctrinal issues. Because it doesn't bother my conscience, it's okay. No, not on doctrinal issues. That's not what we're talking about. We established that earlier on in the chapter. Verse 15, Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, your brother says, whatever this is, food is not the only point. Food is just an illustration to give us in this point. So, with your food, with your stand on this issue, with whatever it is, if your brother is grieved because of whatever the issue is, you're no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with whatever the issue is with your food, the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, if you do not let your good be spoken of as evil, uh, therefore do not let your good be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. This is pivotal. He who serves Christ in these things. In what things? In my checklist religion, making sure I did this, I did that, I did this, I'm good. No. It's in how our influence is being wielded. It's in whether we're offending others who want to be faithful brethren. Let's look at some of these points. 
again, this was supposed to come up as separate bullets. Romans 14, 14, there's nothing unclean of itself. Obviously, some things are inherently unclean and sinful. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. This is an illustration. Nothing is unclean of itself. Well, yeah, well, some things obviously are. And so the reason I'm going to go look at this is to show, yes, yeah, some things are inherently wrong, inherently unclean. So that shows us that Romans 14 is talking about its certain parameters of things that are of doubt. You can do it or you can not do it. And it's okay. It doesn't matter. So 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All things, look at what he goes straight into. Right after this, he says, all things are lawful for me. Obviously not, Paul. Yeah, so I'm out within certain parameters. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. Some versions say expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Well, is idolatry lawful? No. He's talking about, if he goes straight from saying, there are things that you cannot do. If you do this, you do not go to heaven. And he says, all things are lawful for me. Obviously, he's talking about within certain parameters of the things that are lawful. Not all of them are things that I'm going to do. Just because we could doesn't mean we should is a common way to say that. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Here he says, sexual immorality, is it something that's, un that's unclean uh, or is it something that is lawful? Well, it's obviously unclean. He's tying this all together so we can understand this is saying that of the things that are lawful, not all things are expedient or helpful. To him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. He's saying this is something that lies within our heart. Of the things that we can do it or not do it, it doesn't matter either way. To him who considers, the one who's evaluating this, that's the one who has to decide. It's not about us deciding what is right or wrong on our own. A lot of people want to say that. Well, I decide for myself. It says so right there. No, that's not what it's saying at all. So right and wrong if you're uh, in your outline. And then Proverbs 14, 12. You could also write down Proverbs 16, 25 because they say the exact same thing. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. The version, it, you'll, you'll see a little bit different wording in some versions, but it's, it's almost identical across the board. People see something. And they say, this just makes sense. When you get to the end of that road, it's death. It's eternal death. And he's warning us against that. And then Jeremiah 10, 23. Oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Well, why not? We can all decide together. And that's just so intellectual. And it's just so lost. So wrong. It's not about what we think. It's about what the Lord tells us to do. And then also in verse 15 he said, yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, well your brother is grieved or made to stumble. That's another word that Jesus uses, made to stumble because of something that was lawful for me but it was not expedient to be done. We just did it anyway. Now, here's a question. What if we acted out of ignorance? I just didn't know. Well, now we do. We need to fix it. What if it was carelessness? Oh, well, whoops. Well, now we know, and we need to fix it. What if it was out of willful sin? Well, I know he doesn't like it. I know he thinks it's sin, but I'm going to do it anyway. What does the Lord say about willful sin? Go back and look at the end of Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. You can start at verse 26 and read through the end of the chapter because he says there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin when we willfully do it. Don't destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Yes, it can happen, and it obviously does happen, 
He who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. In these things, again, we've talked about this uh, just a little bit already. In what things? In how we influence others. Are we trying to bring others to the Lord? Are we trying to say, this is the wall, and if you don't like it, you stay over there? Because that happens a lot. Matthew 22, 37, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. What is the great commandment? Here it is. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And what do we call the golden rule? The golden rule? Well, love the Lord your God with all your heart. No. The golden rule, you're saying... If that's how you want to be treated, then that's how you treat other people. That's the gist of the golden rule, which Jesus says is the second rule that everything else hangs on. How we influence other people. Are we trying to build the Lord's body up? Or are we trying to say, like it or lump it? So Romans 14, 19. We're going to look at the last of the chapter here. Uh, and we're still going to look at 1 Corinthians 8. We're not quite done. But Romans 14, 19. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace. Pursue means to run. Pursue means military power. We've got to go. We don't have time to mess around. Pursue the things that make for peace. And the things by which one may edify another. Is my influence to edification. Is my influence to peace. Not just peace with God. But you got to realize, I can't have peace with God if I deliberately don't try to have peace with those around me. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Do you see what he calls this? The work of God. What's the work of God? Well, what about those little ones who believe in Jesus? If I destroy them, I'm destroying their faith. I'm destroying the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. Someone who says, well, I like it. This is what I'm going to do anyway. It's good neither to eat meat or drink oinos or do anything by which your brother stumbles. I don't think he's talking about anything sinful here. I don't think he's talking about drinking alcohol at all. Where does oinos? Not to eat meat or drink grape juice or do anything by which your brother stumbles or offended or made weak. How would somebody be offended at eating meat? They might think that it could have been offered to idols. Maybe they think that we should just be vegetarians. How could anybody be offended at drinking grape juice? They might say, well, somebody could see that and think you were drinking alcohol. I don't know. But he says if it bothers someone, I just won't do it. Wow. You know, Paul liked food just like anybody else did. Paul talks about some of his ailments, but he never talked about how he just couldn't stand food. He says, I would not eat these things or drink these things if it makes my brother stumble or be offended or me. Well, hey, you're not really stumbling. It's just kind of making you weak, so it's okay. No. Look at how clear he is about that. Do you, do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. Whatever is not from faith is sin. If I am caused to do something, if I thought that the song leader having a pitch pipe was wrong, I've met brethren who believed that. They said, it's wrong. Am I going to get up there and say, no. I'm not going to do that. They believe it's wrong? Fine. We might be way off key, but I'm just going to sing without it because it's not going to be an issue. Let's look at some of these points then. Pursue peace and edification, edifying one another. It's about our influence and about our effect. The effect of our influence. Don't destroy the work of God. It's evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat or drink oinos or do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or made weak and whatever is not from faith is sin. What is faith? 
Well, if you believe in your heart, no, that's Mormon doctrine. If you have faith, what does that mean? Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing the word of God. That's what gives us faith. Ephesians 4, 4 says there is one body, one spirit, just as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith. What well, baptism? One Lord, God, Father of all. Faith is involved in a clean conscience in conforming to the word of God. But unequivocally necessitates the word. Someone says, what well, faith is in your heart. Okay? Just like a conscience. If it's not educated, it's going to put you in the ditch. That's what Jesus meant about the blind leading the blind. It's going to put you in the ditch of destruction. So when people say, well, faith is in your heart. Do you, do you believe this? That's based on the faith that comes from God's Word. Not from how you feel. We just spent the whole Romans 14 trying to see God showing us it's not about how we feel. So let's run through 1 Corinthians 8. The same kind of point that is made in Romans. 1 Corinthians 8, 1. Now concerning things offered to idols. We've already looked at that. Is it okay to eat things offered to idols? We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And this kind of reminds me of the saying that was, I don't know if you all checked the board at SBS when you come by. They had a thing up there saying something like, uh, the only true knowledge is to realize we know nothing. The only true wisdom is to say we know nothing. And that's not what he's saying here. This may be the concept where they got it from. I don't know, but no, we know. God tells us in Romans 1, the end of Romans 1, that if we don't seek God out, we're without excuse because we can know that He's out there just from what we see around. If anyone thinks that He knows anything, He knows nothing, yet as He ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this is one who is known by Him. If anyone thinks He knows something, again, this, what this is going back to is the people who say, well, I feel, I've decided, I think. And He says, that's not the point. That's not the point. What's the law? Down in verse 4, Therefore, concerning the things, uh, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no other God but one. Now notice he's not saying, but you can eat whatever is offered to idols. No, not at all. For even, though, uh, even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, for there are many gods and many lords, remember the word curios was used kind of like Don Pablo, Don was a phrase, and it meant, you know, a, a leader, an esteemed one, basically. Just like we say, sir, or mister, and uh, in, in the British, we're real big on calling people Lord so-and-so. But this is the curios, compared to curios. So verse 6, yet for us there is one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we for him and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things and through whom we live so we don't have a question about this verse 7 however there is not in everyone that knowledge for some with consciousness of the idol until now eat it as a thing offered to an idol they believe that any meat well, it came from the shambles it came from the market so it probably offered to an idol because that's where a lot of the meat came from that was in the market and they eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. They say, I would rather not do this. But they sit down with you, you give them the meat, they, they ate it, and they didn't want to. But they did it anyway. But food does not condemn us to God, for neither if we eat are we better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. Is he talking about things offered to idols? No, they thought it might be. He's not talking about things that were offered to idols. We're forbidden to eat that. Remember Acts 15, and then down here in verse 28, it seems good to the Holy Spirit to abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, from sexual immorality. We cannot eat what's sacrificed to idols. So we go to 1 Corinthians 8 9, but beware lest somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. If anyone sees you, now notice, are we going to be sitting at the bar? Are we going to be sitting down there eating 
fail sandwiches? No, I'm not going to do that at all. What they think, they think that you are. That's what he's talking about. If anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, you wouldn't be down there. <coughs> They're thinking this. Will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? Well, if Greg does it, I, I, I guess we should do it. I just don't believe it is right. Uh, we don't want that. Verse 11, and because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Paul liked a plate of barbecue or meat or things like that just as much as anybody else would. He wasn't saying, well, I don't really like it anyway, so I guess I would. He's not talking about that. These are things he has no problem with. And he says, yeah, I enjoy this too. But because it's for peace, I will forego this. Not make an issue. That's the piece that I saw. That's in the George Bush Museum, Brown College Station. I thought it was neat that they chose one that talks about vision. Yes, you can. There's the wall coming down. And the key word, I don't remember what I wrote on the question, but in talking about this, 10 years before the wall fell, would you have predicted it? 10 years before the wall fell, were there any people sitting around saying, you know, in 10 years, that wall is going to be gone? It wasn't happening like that. The wall was going was to be there forever. But when it did come down, they celebrated. It took tremendous work, but it did come down. And people celebrate it. So here's the crux to this. The reason, and I know I'm going a little long. We're going to try to have a shorter lesson tonight. But we need to look at Romans 14. We need to look at 1 Corinthians 8 and go through them. See exactly what he's talking about. Be familiar with these things. Because we'll be hit with these things in an abusive way if we're not ready to defend it. Who's building the walls of division? There's the problem. And what's all around it? 1 Corinthians 8, 13. If food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. That's saying, if it's going to cause a problem, no way. Who's building the walls of division? Romans 14, 21. It's good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is meat weak. And look at some of the different points. The sources of division. Fellowship halls. New Testament church. Fellowship? He's talked about extensively. It never involves eating food. But fellowship halls, that's what they're about. Baby showers and wedding receptions in the church building. Because they have a fellowship hall to accommodate. Church-sponsored fun and games. Church-sponsored colleges. Church-sponsored orphanages and nursing homes. By the way, this is what you call institutionalism. That's where it all started. Because the church said, well, we can just send them the money and then we'll be doing some good works. Church playgrounds, weddings and funerals at the building, sponsoring church arrangements. By the way, weddings and funerals, well, I know some people make an argument and I'm not going to make a plus. I just, um, I, 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 I'm not going to do that. Sp sponsoring church arrangements, church bake sales and car washes, instrumental music, all of these things are things that people say, I know I don't have to do this to go to heaven, but I believe I can. And on any of these points, think about how many brethren there are across just the Kenai Peninsula, and then across the great state of Alaska, and across all of North America, across the world, and across time. The walls are built, and people say, if you don't like it, you can lump it. These are walls that need to come down. And who's causing the division? The people who say, I believe that that is wrong. God tells us how that's to be dealt with. If someone says, I believe that this is wrong, then who am I to press the issue and say, well, my, my response needs to be say, saying, if it offends you, we just aren't going to do it. If it's something that I believe I can defend from Scripture, is it? Somebody says, well, here's I believe I can defend this from Scripture. Okay. 
Is it something I have a choice about doing? I could go to heaven doing it, or I could go to heaven not doing it. Is it? Would it cause my brother to sin? Brother says, I, I believe this is wrong. If the answer to all three questions is yes, then the Christians can't do it. Christians, faithful children of God, Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 8 says, Christians can't do it. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. There are problems that need to be resolved. Look very quickly, our last slide before we just, did, there's a picture uh, and then the invitation. Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. But there's a special emphasis in Galatians 6, 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, but especially those who are of the household of faith. If we tell our brethren, I don't care if it offends you, this is what we do here. If you don't like it, there's a door. That's a wall that cannot stand. John 17, 20. Jesus in his prayer, this is the true Lord's prayer. Look at what he says. I don't pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they all may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. 1 Corinthians 1, 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. That there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, this is just a matter of judgment. We should have the same judgment. Romans 14, 19, Therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace, and the things by which one may edify another, not to destroy, or do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. This is what we started off with in Romans 14. It ties right back together. This is a thread throughout God's Word. It's not just in these two chapters. There was that day, and that's not Mr. Gorbachev in the background. He was off to the side. We have to tear down the walls of division. You say, well, I'm not the one who put them up. I'm not the one who keeps them there. No, but just being more equipped to help others see the error. Can you imagine the day of rejoicing when we help one person see this is a wall that should not stand and they say, if I can't break it down, I'm at least going to get on the other side of it. That's what needs to be done. There is great rejoicing in heaven when we bring one soul to obedience they've been wrong. If you're not a Christian, now's the time to become a Christian. If you haven't put on Christ in baptism, repenting of your sins, and confessing Jesus, now's the time. And there may not be another opportunity. If you've started on that way, and we can pray with and for you, if there's any way that we can help, please come forward as we stand and sing.